I'm obviously going to be just giving you guys an introduction to Tether and Bitfinex today. Um, first, I want to start with why should anyone care about Tether and Bitfinex? And the simple reason for that is that they are perennially dishonest actors in the cryptocurrency space who control a large fraction of the total liquidity and the market as a whole. Bitfinex historically has been one of the largest spot exchanges in the cryptocurrency space, and Tether has always been by far the largest stablecoin. Um, it's difficult to say exactly what proportion of the total volume can be attributed to Tether trading, because a lot of the exchanges that use Tether are also guilty of wash trading and trying to artificially inflate their own volumes. But it would seem that Tether probably accounts for about half of the total volume in the cryptocurrency space. And it's, of course, this huge about $30 billion pool of total liquidity. Um, since the BitMEX fall, when their executives were indicted by the US government and their volume plummeted precipitously after that, Tether has also become one of the more common sources of collateral for various uh, margin trading and other leverage trading in the cryptocurrency space, especially on Binance where you see their futures and stuff all being collateralized with Tether. Um, so the reason it's important to care about Bitfinex and Tether is because they act in like such a central place in the ecosystem and yet are dishonest about the nature of their operations and their own role. I'm going to just give a little bit of a brief history lesson into where this exchange and this stablecoin came from, some of the problems they've had historically and then where they are right now, just to give you guys a lay of the land in regards to these two companies. So Bitfinex was founded in 2012 by Raphael Nicolet, who was a help desk technician in France and a frequent Ponzi scheme enthusiast who decided to use stolen code from the failed Bitcoin exchange, Bitcoinica, to start his own exchange. So to give a little bit of extra context here, Raphael Nicolay was an active user on the Bitcoin talk forums. And on here, he would frequently participate in various pyramid schemes, lending schemes, and other high yield investment programs like that, including losing a large number of his Bitcoins in the famous Pirate at 40 Trend and Shavers uh, Bitcoin Ponzi scheme. What made him even more of a controversial figure during this period is that uh, besides participating in these various Ponzi schemes, he was a very vocal defender of the people who ran them, insisting that other people who criticized these schemes were doing it for vendettas or out to get the people and stuff like that. After he lost a significant portion of his Bitcoins when this Ponzi scheme failed, he decided to start his own over-the-counter service where he'd be matching various Bitcoin buyers and sellers. As part of this, he decided to try to start his own lending service where he would take Bitcoins people lent him, find a way to make profit from them, and he guaranteed people a 2% return weekly on any Bitcoins they lent him. Um, this didn't last for very long because he quickly received criticism from various people on the forums in the community about why they should trust their Bitcoins with a person who's known to participate in these various Ponzi schemes and who is promising them these high returns. So after he really fails to get that started, about a month later, he comes out and announces Bitfinex which is going to be this new cryptocurrency exchange that pulls liquidity from a variety of other exchanges besides matching on its own end. And it was built using the stolen Bitcoinica code. Bitcoinica had gone bankrupt about a year before after a couple of hacks and a variety of other problems. It had been written by a 17 year old in Ruby on Rails and was known to be in very insecure and buggy code base. So that was what Bitfinex was founded on. Shortly after this, 
the business started uh, Giancarlo Davisini, the current chief financial officer of both Bitfinex and Tether, meets Rafael Nicolet and joins the budding corporation. Um, Giancarlo Davisini notably got in trouble with the uh, European authorities because he had been selling pirated Microsoft software back in the late 90s. Um, shortly after this, Bitfinex receives um, investment from undisclosed Asian investors and John Ludovicus Vanderveld comes on as the CEO of Bitfinex with the co-CEO initially. And then uh, Raphael gets demoted to CTO. John Ludovicus Vanderveld is an interesting character because it's hard to find much information about him. Whenever there are public facing statements from either Bitfinex and Tether, they're generally coming at this point from Paolo Arduino, the CTO, Stuart Hogner, the general counsel, or rarely from Giancarlo, the CFO. There have been basically zero statements from JLVDV since he started in 2013. Just, just one, one comment, right? To, to put this into perspective, right? Like this, this is, um, you know, paints paints a picture of of uh, you know the the uh, executives that that you know run this exchange. And again, if if you look at the 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 cryptocurrency world, Bitcoin and and Ethereum, you have the regulated small-ish exchanges that you know you, you hear of and that are very present, right? Coinbase and and so on and so forth. But a, a very significant, if not larger volume of, of the liquidity of the trades taking place today happens in, in these companies that are run by, by, by these people with, uh, and, and, and Bennett, correct me if this is wrong, effectively no uh, regulatory oversight or, or audits whatsoever. Is, is, that, is that a fair statement? That, that is a fair statement. I mean, the leading exchange for um, volume at this point is Binance, which is playing a complicated regulatory arbitrage game where they exist in every jurisdiction and no jurisdiction simultaneously, claiming that whichever country you're in, you're interacting with one of their subsidiaries from a different country and playing complicated shell games to try to avoid regulations. And you've seen this same pattern from the exchanges that came before that, like Bitfinex, where they're trying to set up in various offshore regimes like the British Virgin Islands, where they can avoid a lot of the regulatory scrutiny that other exchanges like Gemini, like Coinbase, like even uh, Bitstamp or Kraken, like the ones that are domiciled in more regulated places generally have to deal with. Um, Tether was started a couple of years after that in 2014 it was originally named RealCoin and was started by Brock Pierce, Craig Sellers, Jonathan Yantis, and William Quigley. Brock Pierce, of course, notable for his earlier time at DEN and IGE and his connections to figures like Mark Collins Rector. Um, for people who aren't aware of the story, Brock Pierce was close friends with Mark Collins Rector and was sued along with him for child sexual abuse. Uh, Mark Collins Rector ended up charged and Brock Pierce and him went to Spain where they were both arrested in a house full of child pornography. Um, they, Brock Pierce eventually had the charges dropped against them, against him uh, and Collins Rector disappeared somewhere into Europe. Um, he still will make, a, you'll see occasional people mentioning him often under the alias Morgan von Phoenix, but he's avoided a lot of public appearances since then. But these, this group of people, Brock Pierce, Craig Sellers, Jonathan Yentis, and William Quigley had worked together on the MasterCoin Foundation. MasterCoin was started in 2012 by J.R. Willett with the goal of being a second layer on top of Bitcoin. It was meant to enable um, the issuance of new tokens, decentralized exchanges, multi-signature wallets, and a variety of other features that were not easily done on the native Bitcoin layer. This MasterCoin Foundation eventually rebranded to Omni. So if you hear me mention Omni, which is what they're called now, it's the same as this MasterCoin Foundation which was announced in 2012. Uh, in 2014, Brock, this team of people announces RealCoin. 
Realcoin was supposed to be the first dollar-backed token on the blockchain. Shortly after this, in September or so of 2014, Bitfinex acquires Tether, or more accurately, Digfinex, the parent company of both Bitfinex and, Ty and Tether, acquires Tether. And they uh, first incorporate it as Tether Limited in the British Virgin Islands. And it was the principals for it were Giancarlo Davisini, the CFO of Bitfinex, and Philip G. Potter, the chief strategy officer of Bitfinex. The very first tethers were issued in November of 2014. Um, the reason I'm belaboring this timeline a little bit is because for years, Bitfinex denied their connection to tether um, in a variety of very public ways. And well into 2017, they claimed to not own Tether, not have any interest in Tether, anything like that. And it was only revealed when the Paradise Papers leaked that showed Applebee's function in the British Virgin Islands that this information became public. Even when Bitfinex and Tether sued Wells Fargo together in 2017, Phil Potter, their chief strategy officer, was still in whale pool team speaks denying the connection between Bitfinex and Tether. A few months after that, he would eventually come out and acknowledge that they did and had owned Tether for an extended period of time before this. From here, we're going to discuss some of the Bitfinex and Tether hacks that have occurred because these, their responses to these hacks help elucidate certain things about their business. In May of 2015, the same month that Rafael Nicolay left Bitfinex, their hot wallet was hacked and drained of about 1,500 Bitcoins. Um, they claimed that they covered this loss out of their company funds. No traders were impacted, but there was also never any explanation given for how this hot wallet hack occurred or what had gone wrong to make it possible for these Bitcoins to be drained. This in combination with, okay, so that happened in May of 2015. Early in 2016, Bitfinex had to sign a consent degree with the Commodities, Future, Commodities and Futures Trading Commission in the United States, which is the United States regulatory body that oversees, well, commodities and futures trading. Um, Bitfinex was alleged to have been offering illegal off-exchange derivative to, derivatives to U.S. citizens and residents. Bitfinex signed a consent decree, accepted a fine, and agreed to no longer offer these kind of products to U.S. residents. Um, in order to continue offering similar products, Bitfinex partnered with BitGo, the popular multi-signature wallet and custody provider in order to update their wallet infrastructure. Their goal was one, to make a more secure system that would hopefully avoid the problems of the earlier hack in 2015. And two, allow them to segregate each user's balance on the blockchain so that for US citizens and residents who were trading these futures contracts, they could physically deliver the Bitcoins in the same way that the, interna international, the International Commodities Exchange and other companies would do years later than this. However, in, about, in or about the middle of 2016, Bitfinex suffered one of the largest hacks in Bitcoin history for a total of about 120,000 Bitcoins, which at the time was about 75 to $78 million worth. Now these Bitcoins are, well, I did this a couple days ago and it was 5.6 billion. So it's probably a little bit more now. Um, so now those Bitcoins are worth $5.6 billion. Bitfinex had previously promised early in their history that any losses ever suffered by Bitfinex would be covered by Bitfinex and would never come out of traders funds or anything like that. They broke that promise after this hack. Um, the exact mechanism of this hack is still somewhat unexplained, although a couple of potential explanations have been proposed. 
Amin Gunsir, the Cornell professor, has discussed one possible explanation for how this hack could have occurred. The multi-signature wallet that they were using with BitGo was a two of three signed wallet. We needed two out of the three keys to authorize a transaction. Bitfinex controlled one key, BitGo the other, and then for at least the US citizens and residents, they were supposed to control the third key so that it would, you would need at least two out of those three to ever authorize a withdrawal. The proposed mechanism by which this hack occurred is that a hacker was able to, or potentially someone with other information, was able to get the Bitfinex private key and then was able to get the API signing key that would tell BitGo to sign the transaction when Bitfinex would put the request in. However, that at best only partially explains it because one of the fundamental features of BitGo is a set of withdrawal limits, warnings, and other things that are supposed to prevent a cascading failure like this. So the likely explanation is either that two of Bitfinex's API keys were compromised, meaning the one that authorized transactions and the other one that would be used to modify other parts of the setup, meaning remove withdrawal limits or things like that. Or Bitfinex was using the same API key to both sign the transactions and that key had the ability to make other permissions changes to the BitGo setup. Bitfinex did commission a security report by Ledger Labs to look into the cause of this hack, but they have never disclosed the results of that investigation. And so it is often still difficult to determine exactly what happened during this hack. In order to deal with the multi-million dollar losses of this hack, Bitfinex had to make some interesting choices. They announced that they were going to be giving all of their customers and clients a haircut to their accounts that worked out to about 36% of their total in order to deal with the losses that Bitfinex had suffered. It later came out, thanks to some reporting from Nathaniel Popper of the New York Times, that Coinbase threatened to sue Bitfinex when they heard this proposal that they were not going to accept a haircut to any of their Bitcoin they had stored on Bitfinex. And it seems that they did not receive the same haircut as everyone else. Um, Bitfinex still claims in all of their public documents that they gave the haircut to everyone, but that does not seem to be what the reporting around this hack suggests. Um, for each dollar of value that was taken out of a user's account, they were credited with a single BFX token. Uh, the goal of Bitfinex was to eventually repay these tokens either with cash or with equity, but they made sure when issuing it to add a whole bunch of waivers and disclaimers to try to reduce their legal liability associated with it. These tokens were all eventually paid off or converted to equity, but it seems like a large portion of them did end up converted to equity, and this had a couple of interesting effects. First, just the conversion to equity made many of the people who were Bitfinex's harshest critics after this hack and this haircut, then devoted supporters of Bitfinex because they now had a vested interest in Bitfinex's continued existence and success. Um, Bitfinex also issued a second token at this time called the RRT or Recovery Rights Token, which was meant to incentivize the conversion of these tokens into equity in Bitfinex. The Recovery Rights Token was a token that offered these people who converted their BFX tokens to equity, a right to a portion of any recovered funds from the hack. So specifically the RRT token was worth a dollar of the recovered hacked funds, or if the recovered funds were insignificant or were not enough to cover the total number of outstanding 
RRT tokens, they were meant to be dis distributed on a pro rata basis between the RRT token holders. Furthermore, um, at this same time, Giancarlo Davicini, the chief financial officer of Bitfinex, is talking to traders in whale pool team speaks in places like that and saying that it could be quite some time until they have the cash available to pay back these BFX tokens, but that there are a variety of Asian investors and other people who would be interested in buying BFX or iFinex shares. And so that if you were willing to convert to equity, it was likely that you'd be able to get liquidity for that sooner than waiting for Bitfinex to pay you back for the token. It is unclear to this day exactly how much of the BFX tokens got converted to equity and how much Bitfinex eventually paid back. But it seems that a significant portion of them were converted to equity, especially in light of the fact that shortly around this same time period, Bitfinex got cut off from much of their banking infrastructure. Which also leads us into the issue of audits. So since its very beginning in 2014, Tether promised regular third-party audits of their finances. Um, this was done in order to comfort people who were worried that a dollar collateralized stablecoin could potentially be problematic if it ended up insolvent due to risks of a run on the bank or any number of other issues. In the seven years since Tether has made that promise, or six and a half, Tether has received zero audits. After Bitfinex was hacked in 2016, they promised that they would get and release a full security audit and a full financial audit. Bitfinex hired Ledger Labs, a security consulting firm to help out with the security report. It was never released and Ledger Labs does not list them among their former clients, but Bitfinex claims that the report, the investigation by Ledger Labs did occur. Bitfinex and Tether both hired the auditing firm Friedman LLP to audit their financial statements. Eventually, a Tether spokesperson came out and made a statement saying that the procedures the auditor wanted to go through were too deep, too thorough, could not be completed in a reasonable amount of time, and Tether would not be getting an audit from them. Bitfinex has never updated us on the status of their audit from Friedman, but I think it's safe to assume that it's not coming. Tether has gotten several attestations, consulting reports, and various letters to try to confirm to people that they have the reserves they were supposed to. First, in late 2016 and early 2017, they were getting monthly attestations from an incredibly small Taiwanese accounting firm called Top Sun CPAs and Company. Um, this is a very small firm. As far as I can tell, they don't even have a website, um, but there have been other people who've called up the uh, Taiwanese body that governs CPAs and have confirmed that the firm does exist and that the person who signed the attestations is a registered CPA. So for about a four month period in late 2016 and early 2017, Tether did get monthly attestations. After this, there is a long gap until we finally get a report from Friedman who had originally been hired to audit Tether. After it was determined Friedman was not going to be able to audit Tether, Friedman did issue a report to Tether describing what they saw when they looked at the bank accounts. This report is very specifically labeled not for public release, private use only, not an auditor attestation, and has a whole bunch of other associated disclaimers like that on it. Tether immediately released it to the public because they wanted some kind of public documentation that they had funds in their accounts. After this, it was about a year 
until we got the next look into Tether's solvency and reserves. <coughs> and this came from a consulting group made up of lawyers called Free Sporkin and Sullivan. They um, issued a report looking again at the accounts that Tether disclosed to them and showed that the dollars in those accounts were greater than the number of Tethers in circulation. However, this report is interesting for a couple of reasons. Um, at this time, Tether is banking at Noble Bank, which was not a bank, but was an international financial entity out of Puerto Rico, which was started by Brock Pierce, who as we previously mentioned, was one of the founders of Tether. Eugene Sullivan, one of the three named partners at Free Sporkin and Sullivan, was on the board of directors for Noble Bank. Um, Free himself had previously worked with Brock Pierce and John Betts, the guys who started Noble at Sunlot when they had issued their um, proposal to the Mount Gox creditors to revive Mount Gox. So they did get this report from Free, Sporkin and Sullivan, but for me, it always seemed to be too conflicted. When you've got the person giving the report also being an executive director at the bank and the interconnection between the founders of these institutions. After that, we do not get any more reports on Tether's solvency until November 1st of 2018, when we get a letter from Deltec Bank that I'll discuss in a couple minutes. Um, since November 1st of 2018, there has been no public third party review, attestation, audit, letter, or anything looking at Tether's reserves, either value or composition. I think it's valuable to pause here again and just look at just the same pattern of dishonesty that we've seen with Bitfinex and Tether before, where they are very willing to make a promise in public in order to deal with a temporary crisis or to assuage fears or to convince people of a certain thing, but they feel much less of an obligation to fulfill the promise and to go through these steps inherent in that. Um, going back to November of 2017, after looking at the two Bitfinex hacks, Tether was hacked as well. About 30 million tethers were removed from the tether treasury by an unknown attacker. Um, this hack is again very strange because Omni had options for multi signature wallets and things like that. And so a compromise of the tether treasury feels as though it would be difficult if tether was following best practices for security and stuff here. But again, we do not know the actual mechanics of the hack because Tether has never discussed them publicly. What they did do is after they saw these Tethers leave their account is they created a new version of the Omni client. So the piece of software that runs on all the various nodes that maintain the Omni network. And it was issued to all the major Tether integrated exchanges and things like that. And they effectively forced a hard fork of the Omni layer. Tether accounted at this point for like 70 or 80%, perhaps even more of the total transaction on the Omni layer and were by far the largest economic player on the chain. So when they issued this client that basically forbade these coins from being moved on Omni, it was very quickly picked up by various um, exchanges and those tethers that were stolen got frozen. Shortly after this, in December of 2017, Tether working with the Omni team created a new feature that allowed for these managed properties on Omni where the issuer could freeze them at any time. Tether still maintains this ability and it has been integrated into their smart contracts on the other various chains they're on now. All tethers in circulation can be frozen by Tether or by someone with those keys at any time. Um, this to me feels a little antithetical to the promises that Tether made early on in their white paper and various things like that, 
where they claimed that Tether would have the same censorship resistant properties as Bitcoin. Now, even at the time, that was a somewhat absurd claim because you're talking about a centralized dollar token where the dollars are in a bank somewhere or controlled by someone. It was never going to have that same properties. But at this point, they don't even pretend to have the same transaction censorship resistance. It's been eliminated for years from their functioning. So Crypto Capital Corp is one of the key companies that has worked with Bitfinex and Tether. They are a payment processing company that was started in Panama, is an unlicensed money transmitter that has worked with a variety of exchanges in the space, including Kraken, Bitfinex, Bitmex, Quadriga, and a variety of other exchanges. Bitfinex worked with Crypto Capital Corp starting in 2014, but really accelerated their relationship in 2017 because Wells Fargo, their United States correspondent bank, cut them off from correspondent banking services. Crypto Capital Corp, through a variety of shell companies and stuff like that, was able to maintain bank accounts. And so Bitfinex began using them to process withdrawals and to hold their own corporate funds. The problem with Crypto Capital Corp is it seems to pretty clearly be a criminal organization at this point. The president of Crypto Capital Corp was a Panamanian Canadian citizen named Ivan Manuel Molina Lee. He was arrested in Greece and extradited to Poland where he is being charged with trying to aid the Colombian cartels in laundering hundreds of millions of dollars through Bitfinex. Reginald Fowler, one of the other principals for Crypto Capital Corp, was arrested in the United States on charges of bank fraud, wire fraud, and a couple of other types of fraud just for the cherry on top. He had been embezzling from Crypto Capital Corp, taking about 10% off the top of all money that was brought into, into Crypto Capital Corp. And when he was arrested, was found with counterfeit United States currency and fake bond certificates that were alleged that were claiming to be worth over a billion dollars. One of the allegations against him in the indictment was that he had used these bond certificates to try to get additional banking accounts. One of uh, two of the other principles of Crypto Capital Corp are still currently fugitives. That would be the siblings Ravid Joseph and Oz Joseph who had also been part of Crypto Capital Corp and aided in these operations. The, a lot of this information about Crypto Capital Corp and Bitfinex and Tether did not come out until very recently. Um, April of 2019, the New York Attorney General's office filed an injunction against Bitfinex and Tether because they had learned about um, a variety of conflicted transactions that Bitfinex and Tether had entered into. Shortly after this, um, there were indictments filed in both New York and in Arizona against Reginald Fowler and Ravid Yosef. Um, the transactions I, mentor, I mentioned, I'm gonna go over the timeline briefly here because I think it again points to the issues with honesty and disclosure around Bitfinex and Tether. So Bitfinex commingled their client and corporate funds and then gave just over a billion dollars of those to Crypto Capital Corp, allegedly without a contract or any kind of agreement whatsoever. So Bitfinex gave a billion dollars to Crypto Capital Corp, no contract. Eventually, Crypto Capital Corp stopped responding to Bitfinex, stopped servicing their withdrawals, responding to their pleas or anything like this. Because of this, Bitfinex is unable to service their customers' withdrawals. At the same time, publicly, Bitfinex releases a post claiming that all withdrawals are working fine and anyone who is saying otherwise is spreading FUD fear, uncertainty, and doubt, 
and is attacking Bitfinex. Again, Bitfinex knew they were lying when they did this, but they did it nonetheless. This is uh, around like July, in the summer of 2018. November 1st of 2018, we get back to that Dell Tech letter I mentioned. Dell Tech Bank is an offshore bank in the Bahamas, and it is currently where Tether is banked. On November 1st, they issued a letter that said that Tether at their bank had a portfolio cash value of about $1.8 billion. It was slightly more than the number of Tethers in circulation. And so it was meant to convince people that one, Tether had consistent banking and two, they had the money they were supposed to. Now, there's a couple of interesting things here. Dell Tech Bank in the Bahamas is a resident authorized agent bank. I'm not an expert in banking reg regulations and especially not Bahamanian banking regulations, but as far as I can tell, the type of license their bank holds limits their ability to interact with foreign currencies. Resident authorized agents are allowed to interact with foreign securities and with Bahamanian dollars, but not generally with US dollars. Now, I think this is consistent with the phrase portfolio cash value that is used in the letters and suggests to me that the money was likely held in treasury bills or some other relatively stable uh, thing that Tether would be able to withdraw against. At this time, Tether's homepage and their terms of service is still claiming that every single Tether is backed one-to-one -one by the corresponding currency. I also think it's important for us, so November 1st of 2018, this letter is released saying that as of October 31st, they had the money. Sometime in November of 2018, Bitfinex withdraws $625 million from Tether's Dell Tech account. In exchange, Bitfinex credits Tether's account at Crypto Capital Corp where they are unable to withdraw money and haven't been for months, $625 million. This effectively makes Tether insolvent as about a quarter of their backing has now been removed, or a third of their backing has now been removed and replaced with paper money that they do not have any reasonable expectation of being able to access after several months of trying and being rebuffed. At this time, again, Tether's homepage and Tether's terms of service still very publicly proclaim that each Tether is one-to-one -one backed by the corresponding currency. Based on the archives of their page, at some point between February 19th and March 4th, Tether updated their homepage. And instead of saying each was one-to-one -one backed by the corresponding currency, it now said, each Tether is always 100% backed by our reserves which include traditional currency and cash equivalents, which also leads me to believe they're including treasury bills and things like that in cash equivalents. And from time to time may include other assets and receivables from loans made by Tether to third parties, which may include affiliated entities. Each Tether is also one-to-one -one pegged to the dollar. So one Tether is always valued by Tether at $1. On February 26, 2019, they updated their terms of service to now say the, the composition of the reserves used to back Tether tokens is within the sole control and at the sole and absolute discretion of Tether. Tether tokens are backed by Tether reserves, including fiat, but Tether tokens are not fiat themselves. On March of 2019, Tether and Bitfinex enter into the famous conflicted loan agreement. Tether agreed to extend a revolving line of credit to Bitfinex at up to $900 million at an interest rate of 6.5%. Digfinex, the parent company, put up 60 million shares of iFinex, which is one of several corporations that compromised the Bitfinex platform as collateral. Bitfinex and Tether went to great lengths to claim that this agreement was negotiated at arm's length with separate counsel retained for each company in order to negotiate the agreement. The agreement was signed by the same people for both companies, being Giancarlo Davasini and JLVDV. 
Shortly after this, they reversed the earlier transfer of $625 million and withdrew about $750 million from the loan agreement. On April, the New York Attorney General filed their petition to be granted this injunction, and that's when a lot of this information about Tether's operations finally became public. So this is a complicated timeline with a lot of specific shell companies and strange structuring. So there's a couple of things I want to pause on and go back to. If I have correctly interpreted the um, Bahamanian banking regulations, tethers were not backed by the corresponding currency as early as whenever they started banking at Deltec, but definitively on October 31st. This was not disclosed and they did not update their terms of service until the end of February. This swap where Bitfinex withdrew from Tether's bank account obviously made Tether effectively insolvent. Um, furthermore, I think the timing of the letter from Deltec being issued on November 1st and then this swap happening at some other point in November feels to me like they were trying to get the report out in anticipation of making this move so that the, there would be this public assurance of their funds shortly before they then removed a good chunk of the funds. Tether also likes to talk around this earlier swap. They uh, often won't discuss it and will instead immediately start discussing the loan agreement, which was signed in March of 2019. The reason for this, I think, is because they did update their homepage, updated their terms of service, and made those disclosure changes before they entered into the loan, but not before they had made other changes. And their goal is to give the impression that they were doing some amount of adequate disclosure around this. Um, again, I think it is pretty clear that that is not the full and complete story of what Tether and Finex were doing during this period of time. The, there's several other problematic things that we've learned so far from this New York Attorney General investigation. We learned that Bitfinex was not segregating their client and corporate funds, that these were all commingled in various accounts across jurisdictions. Tether as well was commingling their customer and corporate funds. Um, we know that Tether executives would get large irregular payments from these commingled funds. We know that the largest redemption of Tether, according to the documents that Tether provided the New York Attorney General's office was less than $30 million. The reason I think this is a valuable thing to pause on is because since 2017, there have been various OTC desk traders like Dan at CMS Holdings who have come out and defended Tether, saying that for them, Tether had issued and redeemed hundreds of millions of Tethers. See the same kind of statement coming from Michael Novogratz over at uh, Galaxy. But according to the documents provided, the largest redemption was $30 million. So either um, these traders are lying, Tether's documents are a lie, or there are differing definitions of what a redemption is being used by these different groups. We also learned that Tether reserves had been used to purchase Bitcoin. It is unclear to what amount. Um, Paulo and Stu have publicly assured people that it is a very small amount, but Tether's lawyers have argued in court that they did buy Bitcoin, they should be able to buy Bitcoin, and there is nothing that should stop them from having their entire reserves invested in Bitcoin if they so choose. We also learned that Tethers had been loaned to various trading firms, including Galaxy Digital. We learned that Crypto Capital Corp itself had an amount of Tethers underneath their control. Not directly from this, but around this same time, we also heard of some Colombian cartel members who tried to use Tether to bribe some US officials. Um, and the much of this case frustratingly 
has centered around a question of jurisdiction with Bitfinex and Tether both trying to proclaim that they do not have ties to New York and that therefore New York is overstepping their bounds. They're not subject to the investigation. There is that they shouldn't have to be a part of this basically. However, this is this Phil Potter, the former chief strategy officer of Tether lived in New York. Phil frequently emailed with other people in New York to meet with them to set them up with accounts on Bitfinex and Tether. Several of the banks Tether used, including BNY Mellon, Metropolitan, and a couple of those were headquartered in New York. The PR firm that Tether hired, Waxman, is out of New York. Galaxy Digital has offices in New York. Um, the New York Attorney General had a whole bunch of access logs from Bitfinex showing traders logging in and trading from New York, which is a practice that Bitfinex claimed to have ceased in early 2017. So again, you've got a habit of dishonesty from Bitfinex and Tether. And to me, it seemed clear pretty quickly that the argument about jurisdiction was really just a way for Bitfinex and Tether to try to buy time while they um, continued their operation. We also learned at this time in an interesting comment by Brian Whitehurst, who is the one of the attorneys for the New York Attorney General, that Bitfinex did not believe crypto capital when crypto capital told them that their funds had been seized. Um, it's pretty clear at this point that the funds were seized. We've got indictments for even Manuel Molina Lee, Reginald Fowler, and Ravid Yosef. So it's unclear why Bitfinex did not believe that. It's unclear why Bitfinex gave them a billion dollars without a contract. There are a lot of outstanding questions around that that are still yet to be resolved. So what happens next? The last due date in the New York Attorney General case was January 15th. On January 19th, there was a joint update letter filed which requested a 30 day extension of the injunction while Tether, finished, Tether and Bitfinex finished document production. That puts the next due date for that case uh, on the 18th, so next week, and both Bitfinex and Tether and the New York Attorney General's office are supposed to file with the judge to say whether or not the terms of the document exchange have been met and what the next steps will be. Besides that, there is an ongoing Department of Justice investigation into Tether and Bitfinex. Both Tether and Bitfinex were relatively recently subpoenaed by the CFTC, the Commodities and Futures Trading Commission, and are likely under investigation there. But it is unclear if or when any of these agencies will complete their work into Tether and Bitfinex. I think complicating the picture at this point is some of the ties to organized crime like the Colombian cartels, that kind of thing makes this kind of case less of a simple bank or wire fraud case and more of a complicated multi-jurisdictional kind of issue that can require a lot of cooperation to finish appropriately. In conclusion, I think my main point is just that Tether and Bitfinex are incredibly fundamental and integral to the cryptocurrency ecosystem. And they have this habit of dishonesty where they refuse to disclose all these various things they're doing and participating in and how they're doing it and are willing to outright lie to their customers and traders. Yet they often, at least among the people I interact with seem to be given a pass by various cryptocurrency traders and people like that. And so I think it is valuable to hold companies like Bitfinex and Tether to their promises and to pay attention when they seem to be either fraudulent or negligent. Um, so looks like we've got some time left for 